Welcome back everybody, this is Eric here with Iraq Veteran 8888. Today we've got another gun gripe episode for you. I've got a special guest here with me today, Mr. Kevin Dixie with NOC. You guys know his content, you know his Instagram page, great dude, and I'm proud to call him my neighbor now. He lives close by, so we're, we're neighbors, which is great. Yep. You're going to see KD popping in on some gun gripes, uh, I hope, moving forward, if, if he comes back. He, he may not come back after tonight. Maybe. We'll see. That was a good stake. I'm coming back. <laughs> okay, but uh, so we're going to get into this deal with Breonna Taylor. Now, I know that we've already done one initial video, Chad and I, on the situation with Breonna Taylor, and there's a lot of emotion that have flared um, based on what happened there. I mean, I don't think anyone is going to sit here and say that she deserved uh, what happened to her, but we have to look at the facts. And unfortunately, when you look at the pool of facts and the way that those facts get reported in the media, and then when people start kind of, you know, putting their conjectures in there and their opinions, it tends to kind of go a lot of different directions, right? You know, you might have a lot of people that are like more pro police and they're like, oh, well, the police did the right thing or the wrong thing. And then you got folks that might be like, you know, oh, well, you know, Breonna Taylor's boyfriend was a drug dealer, so they got what was coming to him. So there, there's all these, like, random conjectures that get thrown in there and that aren't necessarily fair, right? So um, there's been a lot of developments mm -hmm. with yep. Miss Taylor's, you know, situation, and it's um, there's a lot of emotions kind of flaring over it, you know, and, and a lot of differences in opinions related to it, you know. Right. I think that, um, A, we have to understand that people are allowed to be emotional. You just can't allow your emotions to change the facts, right? But you are allowed to be emotional off of the facts, right? So I think when you break this case down and you look at it, um, it is it is tragic. And we look at it from all different levels, right? Uh, but it's tragic that that young lady had to lose her life. Now, we also are presented with the facts that the state is presenting to us, right? So we have to also understand we're going off what's presented to the public as fact. But then even with that, there are some things that you can at least question when it comes to it. Now, and unfortunately, when it comes to incidents like this, you you have to separate the two. You're allowed to be emotional. Uh, you're emotional about some things, I'm sure. I'm emotional about some things. Um, but when we look at it, are we guiding our emotions in the right direction? And I'm not saying anybody is right or wrong for the way that they're responding to it. Um, I think that there should have been um, some some different things looked at when it comes to the Breonna Taylor case. I believe that it is tragic and I am um, it might not come across right now, but I've been very open and vocal about the tragedy of that young lady losing her life. Um, uh, despite how she lost her life. It's sad. I mean, Breonna Taylor was a young woman. Imagine being her mother, right? Getting that phone call. Imagine being a cousin. And I think that's where some people um, are losing their humanity because they're not respecting the fact that this young lady lost her life. We got people digging into her past. Oh, she rented a car that the boyfriend might have used in 2016. Um, you know, she oh, she should have dated a drug dealer like you aren't human. And granted that, that that leads to a certain point of, you know, hey, this might have been a consequence of uh, decisions you made before. Yeah. But we need to start being more human with saying that, yeah, something you did that might have a consequence. You know, we, we let that validate or invalidate your life. So yeah. saying uh, it doesn't matter. You did something three years ago. Who cares about your life? Like, I think those are the people that have um, some morally corrupt issues they need to deal with. Um, and I don't you know, I have plenty of women in my life, uh, some of them young, but any young person at all, you know, or anybody at all, really, when somebody dies tragically, she's the only person that died in this incident, right? Um, and thankfully, right? I mean, I don't want to see her die, but we don't want to see her boyfriend dead either, or we don't want to see a body full of people laying out in the apartment complex. Like, So w we have to make sure that we are looking at things and supporting her where she needs to be supported, as an American citizen, because that surprises me that so many people, whether you want to look at this as a race issue or not because of her race, uh, or whether you want to look at it as an American issue because she was an American, whether you want to look at it as a first responder issue, because I don't care how you look at it. What we have here is government agents, right? And let's make no doubt about it. Government is local police or agents of the government. They enforce the law. Government agents that may or may not have went into somebody's home unannounced and then that American or Americans inside of that home had a response to that, unknowing who was coming in the home. So that's where we start getting into 
into what do we believe as American values? Does it mean that you hate and you want to murder our police? Absolutely not. But does it mean that there is a responsibility if you're going to dig into her past and try to make sure her past can validate her life? Then we also, which I think is a horrible thing to do, we also have to make sure we are holding law enforcement accountable to make sure that they did the right thing. Because we also, in support of whatever you want to call it, you can't, you don't want a world where it's okay for the the cops sort of is to enter your home, you not know about it, and then you're charged for defending your property, right? What kind of precedent do you want to set here? You know, it's well, very important to look at it. And I, I think that, and, and I can catch flack for this, I don't care, but just because someone dated a drug dealer doesn't invalidate their life, okay? You know, love is a blind thing, right? When mm -hmm. we're put in these situations, you, you will do things uh, that probably are, are slightly outside of character. And it's not for me to judge someone's character as to being positive or negative. All we can do is look at the particular situation. And, you know, in our initial video on Breonna Taylor, of, of course, we, we don't want to see a position where someone gets hurt. I mean, she was a first responder. So there there is that sort of, you know, area that gets crossed, right? Where, you know, if you are pro-police or if you are pro-firefighter and first responder, it's like, well, that's a double whammy, right? Because now you've got a fellow first responder who has unfortunately gotten themselves mixed up into a very bad situation. And unfortunately, it resulted in her death. And, you know, no matter how you look at the situation of drug culture or whether or not someone should have kept that sort of company, all of those things are irrelevant. We have to look at the situation and as it unfolded and everything. And I don't think that there's a red-blooded American in this entire country that uh, had someone approach their home at night and unannounced and come in, of course you're going to you know perceive that as a threat because obviously someone's not supposed to be in your home, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's why we saw the charge against the boyfriend get dropped, right? So had the police had this golden goose, uh, this golden egg that the golden goose drops that they could go crack it open and go, well, here we go. We've got a bunch of people saying that we announced our entry and everything. Well, then wouldn't that charge stand, right? So it's like the charge got dropped because they knew that they didn't follow the correct protocol in entering uh, the abodement. And you and you and that's and, and that's a great point because think about it. If you have somebody who shoots a cop and they admit to shooting the cop, case closed. You're 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 cooked. You're done, right? Because Kenneth admitted that yeah, I'm the one that pulled the trigger. I'm the one that placed the shot. However, he also placed a 911 call to state that there was some unknown person or persons outside of his home. So we have to have to know that at that moment he couldn't have known that, right? Because why would right. you call the police on the police if you knew the police were coming through your door, right? Yeah. You would assume that 911 is not going to be on your side because if there's an active warrant to come to your house inside of your house, they're coming in. Right. And they right. would know anyway that the cops were there to begin with. Exactly, right? So, when we have this situation where we have the sergeant went through the door first, right? From the last reports uh, roughly three three officers, I believe, went to the home. There might have been more. I know there was some support staff, but roughly three officers uh, went to enter the home. So when you go in, in, into the front door, and what America needs to slow down is realize this. This isn't, isn't even about being pro-cop, anti-cop, anything. You're at home. It's whatever hours of the night. There's a noise outside of your door. Anybody we talk to that owns a firearm would say, I'm going to get ready for if that noise comes inside, right? You get a boom, boom, your door comes crashing down. You fire at the threat because clearly you can see something, silhouette, something. You fire at the threat that's coming into your home un, um, unwanted. And if the police clearly had, they said they got one from last reports, and this stuff is all fluid, so it could definitely be changing now as we talk. There were basically 10 or 11 people that live in close proximity that said we didn't hear. There was Kenneth Walker. Brianna's not here to give her side of it. Kenneth Walker stated he didn't hear, which is why he shot, which is why he dialed 911. And then you got this one witness on this side that says, well, I did hear them. Well, what did they hear? Did they hear some conversation? Did they see you? So now they say that they heard you because they laid eyes on you and now they kind of know you're out there. Were they outside smoking a cigarette and they saw you get out the car? Like, what's the story there? However, if you had reversed those numbers, if you had 11 people saying, we heard them yelling and announcing, and that cop went in that front door, Kenneth Walker would still be in prison now. Because they're going to say, no, you knew. 
So we have to question, even if it is a fact that there is one individual that says, yeah, I heard them announce. There are 11 people that said they didn't. Why did, it's just a question, if you were shooting a cop, especially in this climate, and you were wrong for doing it, and you admit it to actually shooting them, why would the state drop the charge? And it's because they don't have conclusive evidence. The prosecuting attorney let him out because he's like, we don't have the evidence. The cops didn't drop that charge. The, prosec the state attorney general, didn't, the prosecuting attorney in that area said, no, nah, we don't. We ain't got enough, man. Let them out. Now, is there some political pressure coming with that? Sure. Yeah. You also have to look forward and and deal with some of the things that we we were fed that the if you go by the testimony of the officer that was shot kind of changes the narrative we thought in the beginning uh, where uh, I believe the first reports were Brianna was laying in her bed when she was unfortunately uh, killed. Well, you know, that officer is stating that he saw two people at uh, down the hallway you know, when he saw the one figure aim the gun in a firing motion, he heard a boom. He felt heat in his leg. He realized he was shot. Well, uh, people are saying, well, you know, well, she was wrong for getting up. Look, guys, how it is almost a natural thing unless you train beyond it, that if the man gets up to address a threat, the woman's going to a lot of times like yeah. come and kind of investigate or hide behind them unless you train beyond that. It's just a natural thing to do. So. Granted, Brianna might have been standing there, which is how she, um, you know, was injured. So when they fire in return, which is something that we can definitely say is if they didn't do things right, was something they shouldn't have did. But if your partner gets shot, what are you going to do? You're going to shoot back. It's you're going to shoot back. It's just ingrained in it, the yeah, psyche. Yeah, you're going to do it. And the cop that was shot started shooting back as well. Now, they still hold the responsibility. Now, the report states that they announced. If they didn't announce properly or didn't announce at all, right, I still think they need to hold that accountability and that responsibility. But when you fired into the dwelling, what people need to realize is even the way that the media is feeding this to us now, no officers were charged in the death of Breonna Taylor. And that's what we have to be very clear about, whether you agree with that stance or not. Facts. No officers were charged. The officer, and I'm forgetting his last name at the time, I wrote up a, a thing on it, but that officer was charged for the rounds that went into uh, an adjacent dwelling that contained a pregnant wife, her husband, and her five-year-old child. That's where you get the three counts of wanton endangerment. There was never a charge in the case of Breonna Taylor. Here's what I believe is happening. The City doesn't want to see a civil suit. Now, guys, if you don't understand the difference between a leak, uh, a, 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 uh, the law and, and civility when it comes to the way that they separate them in the courts, you, you just dig into it a little bit, right? Because um, the legal system and a civil system are different. So civilly, look at all the, rightfully so, all the public attention this has gotten, right? Right. So do I really want to drag this out in civil court? Probably not. Yeah, it's not going to end well. Not at all, right? Uh, not for our bank accounts, anyway. All right? So... We fork over $12 million to Breonna Taylor's uh, mother. Okay, we give her $12 million. Previously, a few months ago, we dropped the charges against Kenneth Walker. We're going to give the mother ten, uh, $12 million. And then we're going to make sure that we don't charge any officer with anything involved in that incident. So what we basically did was washed our hands with it. You shot a cop, doesn't matter. Um, you guys killed her, but it was in justification because you did take incoming fire but we're not going to look too deep into you about whether you properly announced or not we're just going to take your word for it that you did we got one witness we got 11 people that are saying against it if we take that to court that's not going to look good right so let's just save us the embarrassment and drop it and then mom we're going to give you 12 million dollars to shut up Shut so, up, money, yeah. yeah, you know, hush money. Now, mom is still pretty vocal. I don't think it worked quite the way they thought it was going to work. But that's how Nothing can bring your daughter back. Now, I'm, that, and that's what I'm trying to employ in people. It is I think it is so heinous to be able to look at somebody that died. Brianna Taylor, I can even understand if and I'm saying it would have been cool, but I can almost better understand if. Kenneth Walker would have took the incoming shots and he would have succumbed to his injuries because then it would have been like, hey, you were in a gunfight. You you lost a gunfight. Whether we think it was righteous or not, you were engaged in battle. I think somebody comes in your house. You didn't know it was the cops. You damn it. You might lose a fight. It's and okay. to be completely fair. OK, if you are a law enforcement officer now, no matter what, 
the circumstances are in which you enter a situation, whether it's, all right, we're serving a warrant or we're investigating X, Y, Z, whatever, none of that matters. It's safe to say that any human being, when fired upon, is going to fire back. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the hopeful part of me, and it's not even a good thing to consider, but the sort of hopeful and human side of me wants to sort of think, all right, well, maybe Brianna was just caught in some horrible crossfire and was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but the responding officer doesn't know that she wasn't shooting at him. And I'm not saying it's justified, of course not, but, uh, you know, when, it, when the adrenaline's rushing and you've got tunnel vision and there's rounds, uh, it's a two-way range and rounds are going both directions, uh, it can be a chaotic situation, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult situation. Um, I will say also that in regards to the rounds going into, you know, another abodement, endangering the five other people, including one of which a pregnant woman, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You own every single round that leaves your pistol, rifle, shotgun, doesn't matter. Uh, that, that goes down to basic firearm safety, you know, know your target and what's beyond it, right? So I don't think there's a single person out there that given a stressful situation is going to, you know, in a standpoint of their mindset, they're not going to go, all right, well, this guy's trying to kill me right here, but uh, I'm going to wonder that if I miss this guy, that the round is going to go into another abode and hurt someone. I, I think the self-preservation kind of takes over, and it's like you're not really thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying it's an excuse. It's not to make an excuse, but I'm just trying to think about the, the mindset of what, what everybody's going through in that type of a situation and uh, so does this become a training issue where we can go, all right, well, maybe responding police officers need to um, do a better job of announcing themselves, do a better job with their tactics. Is it a training issue? Is it a policy issue where these police are um, being forced to go in and do these, these things um, because the policies suck? Well, I mean, one could argue that, you know, going and kicking someone's door in and shooting someone over over drugs, you know, one might argue that that's not a good enough reason to do that, right? Uh, I, I personally am not going to look at a situation and say, okay, well, just because someone was involved with drugs, their life is automatically forfeit. So I think that becomes the, the difference, right, in opinion and how people feel on the situation because you've got folks that from a viciously conservative standpoint might go, well, I am uh, vehemently opposed to drug use, and every single drug user is a criminal in waiting and just doesn't know they are, and they're going to live some horrible, heinous life, and they all deserve to go or whatever. There's people that are going to think that way, right? There's nothing that can escape that type of ideology in terms of how they approach folks that live within that sphere. But however, it, the human side of it, when we look at just human decency and what's right and what's wrong is the result of that event and what happened is a result of poor policy as well. You know, not only from a fiscal level in terms of government and laws and passing laws and rules and edicts and ordinances and everything, but then also to the enforcement end of things, you know. No-knock raids should be illegal. No-knock raids should be illegal. And that is definitely one of the things that we've tried to push home forever. But then also it's like if you are going to announce yourself, serve a warrant or whatever, from a training disposition, that there needs to be a more stringent and calculated approach to how those things are handled, if they're even handled under those circumstances at all moving forward, right? One could argue that, um, you know, the whole 2, 2 a.m., when, when did this uh, event occur in terms of About time? six months ago. Right, but I mean, at what time of the day? Was it like middle oh, it of the was, night? Oh, it was some, it, nighttime. Yeah, right. definitely at night. So it's like you've already got people who are being, you know, risen from their sleep from some crazy noise. The automatic, uh, you know, uh, 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 reaction is going to be to grab a gun and investigate the bump of the night, right? That's what we do. You got a flashlight on your gun. You go around. You see what's going on. So you're already at a disposition where you feel like whoever's entering your home is probably not there to sing Kumbaya, right? Right. We already have that idea in our heads when those things occur, right? So if someone's kicking in the door, police, search warrant, do you really think, even if they did announce themselves, which they said they did, all right, not to say whether they did or didn't or whether they can be trusted in their word, but when someone says, you know, police, search warrant, do you really think at 2 o'clock in the morning you're halfway asleep 
and you heard it, the door get kicked, that you're really going to be able to make that out and know what they said anyway. No, you're not. You're not going to know that. You're going to be half asleep. You're waking up, knocking the sleep out of your eye, wondering what's going on. I mean, you're not going to hear that. And especially if you're someone who doesn't live a lifestyle that warrants the police being at your home, right? Because if you lived a criminal lifestyle, then that might always be in the back of your head. I never know when they're going to show up, right? But Brianna, you can you can judge the... I think Brianna was... I, I want to say 26 years old. You're like, what? We're going to... She's a baby, right? And even when you look at Kenneth Walker, this, this was the two A's community, uh, two A community's great opportunity to back him up. He was a legal gun owner. He was a legal gun owner, and he did, he did exactly because I don't believe in my heart that he knew the police were at the door. So with that belief, he did exactly the same thing millions of people say that they would do right now. Somebody's banging on my door at two o'clock in the morning, and I'm not expecting you. When you come into my home. I'm not going to wait to shake your hand. I'm going to press fire on you. Now, we even have to look at this. He fired one time, right? One round. At least that's what they're reporting as of now. He fired one round. If he was a heinous, murderous dude that was looking to murder cops, why didn't he keep shooting? Sure. Why didn't he keep shooting? So I believe when that one round happened, somewhere between that round uh, hitting and whether it was, okay, of ambient lighting flash you see the badge or maybe somebody then start yelling police he realized oh crap i'm done this is over with i got down on the ground um and because they said he was in a he was laying down on the ground as the shots were incoming now, i don't know how true that is but that's what the report says so maybe brianna didn't move fast enough and you know unfortunately she was struck so even even then that guy seemed to realize oh crap this okay okay i didn't know let me quit. Let me quit. Let me get out of this. Right. And I hope that we make it through it. And all you can do is at that time, if you're not a person that's looking to hurt anybody is lay down. And, you know, he's not a he's not a trained professional that knew to grab her to the ground, too. Right. Most people will say that should have been instinctive. Well, OK, a lot of things should be instinctive. Um, and I'm not going to de uh, demonize him. Right. It was just it was a perfect storm of, of bad situations. It was a perfect storm of bad situations. And now we have that started from bad policy. Exactly started from bad policy, you know, and they were even said they got the approval to do the no knock. And what they are saying is that a commander uh, overrode and said that you must announce. So it seems like to me you're really trying to clean a lot of stuff up. So you got you got a warrant for a no knock, but you're claiming before you actually went out to do to execute the uh, the the raid or whatever. You're, you're stating that, oh, a commander, you know, called an audible and said that now you must announce but the there's an SOP for a reason. Where the hell did that come from? Every police department, military unit has SOPs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have SOPs for a reason. Like when all else fails, refer to the SOP. That's what it's for. It's standard operating procedure. I mean, that's just what it is. So it is is it is in my belief, even we're looking at the facts. I, I do not ignore the facts in the case. One, let's start off with this. Brianna Taylor should be alive. And somebody somebody should be responsible for that young lady losing her life. Two, the facts is laid out by the state. You can look at that and say, OK, it seems to me, especially with the one witness versus the 11 witnesses and you're not charging Kenneth Walker. It seems to me that you realize that's a losing fight. So Kenneth Walker, let's face facts. I've dealt with prisoners a long time. If you are looking at a attempted murder on a law enforcement officer, you're hearing what kind of time that comes with. Like, right. And then they open the doors and let you out. You're probably done with this. Like, oh, I'm free. I don't want anything else. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Right. Because I went from facing 25 to life to free. OK, I'm going to take that. Yeah, they're going to walk away. From yeah, that. you're going to walk yeah. away from it because it's intimidating as hell. Right. Of um, and then you 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 look at the officers who, you know, I, I don't I don't believe tactically did all the right things. Um, but, yeah, they're going to they take incoming fire. They're going to fire back. That's that's going to be a response. Um and then you look, unfortunately, Brianna loses her life as a consequence of that. And then mom, boyfriend's freed. Mom is paid. Right. And I'm not saying mom's being paid off because mom is still very vocal. Um, but mom is paid as a way to try to calm her down. We're going to let all the cops go. We're not going to charge anybody with this incident, including Kenneth Walker. But we're going to charge this third officer with the fact that the rounds went into an adjacent dwelling and you're going to be charged basically with what I call reckless endangerment, wanton endangerment. And that's going to be it. Um, from what I heard, even some rounds went into some other units or whatever, but he wasn't charged for whatever reason, which is fine. Uh, however, 
even when you look at the want, the wanton endangerment, the wanton endangerment, it carries a, a maximum sentence of five years, a minimum of one. But there's also um, uh, clearly a way he can get onto different di uh, diversion programs and things like that where he serves no jail time. Right. So even with him, I don't believe he's going to get any jail time. This is literally saying you're an escape goat. We aren't going to charge you with anything pertaining to Breonna Taylor. We're going to charge you with the fact that your rounds went into this other building. Right. So we're going to charge you with that. So we can say that we're doing something. But the way the media broadcasted, only one officer charged. No, no officers were charged when it comes to Breonna Taylor. So it's a perfect wash of the hands yeah. to let everybody off the hook to say this was a bad situation. But the problem with that is Breonna's not alive. Had that young lady still been alive, I could better understand washing it, throwing it under the rug. Hey, you get money, you get freedom. Yeah. You know, or, or maybe it winds up being one of those situations where, hey, your sergeant took a bullet. Brianna got grazed. All right. We're just going to agree to live and let live. Mm -hmm. if that didn't happen. No. And really, the, the situation just sucks. That's the bottom line. And I think that the, what made the situation happen was crappy policy and you know, making criminals out of people that don't need to be criminals, I believe. I I'm probably catch flack for that, but I don't care. All right. And then also, I, I am not going to sit here and say in a million years that the police that were, let's just say, responding to this situation, dealing with this situation, I don't think it's one of those deals where they're going to walk in the door and just have a hard on for wanting to hurt somebody. I, I don't think it was heinous, like, oh, let me just hurt this person, right? But when fired upon, you're going to fire back. So just like, um, you know, the folks inside the abodement, obviously, you're going to fire at what they deem is a threat in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. In this same conjecture, obviously, uh, a policeman that's getting shot at is going to assume that more rounds are coming and they're going to shoot back. And I think that the general situation just sucks. And at this point, it's like almost really all we can do is try to learn from it and try to prevent things like that from happening in the future and try to not allow policies to become law that put people into those situations, both law enforcement and civilian. Uh, so there are definitely a lot of sort of many tragedies that equate to, uh, you know, the one fact that we're not going to get Brianna back. But how do we make what happened uh, not happen again? And I think that's the most important thing to look at sort of moving forward is, is you know, is it a training disposition? You know, obviously, we probably need to do away with no-knock warrants, no-knock raids. Um, one could argue that, you know, no-knock no warrants and, and those types of police actions, it, it's, it's to make the survivability of the police officer higher, right, uh, by having an unannounced visit, so to speak. But I feel like you're, you're, you're injecting a little bit more danger into the situation than you really, you know, realize. It's like if you've got a warrant to talk to this person, and honestly, you're more qualified to discuss law enforcement background than I am, but from my perspective, remember, this is all perspective, mm -hmm. not necessarily, you know, I'm not claiming to be, you know, the guy on this, but from my perspective is, why, if you've got a warrant, why couldn't you just tail the guy into town and pick him up in a parking lot somewhere, or, you know, do it in a position where you're really, you're, you're still a little vulnerable and you're not going to try any bull crap, but you're also sort of just in an, in a regular environment, like I don't know, well, grocery the crazy store part parking is, lot. The crazy or, part is the main target had already been apprehended. They had a warrant for two locations. He had already been apprehended. And here's where I would challenge the American people to, to use a little bit of reason while they're trying to slaughter this young lady in her untimely death. When they went, you know, and that incident occurred, as bad as it was. You know they searched that apartment, right? They didn't find any drugs. What drugs have you heard reported? Even when the attorney general came out with his ruling a couple of days ago, his findings, find me one mention of drugs, paraphernalia, baggies. Yeah, and wasn't that like the entire reason? That was reason? the whole reason right. for going in there. So be careful about slaughtering her because what you're doing is you're, you're slaughtering human decency in the process. Even after, because you know... If this situation went bad, we're going to try to find anything we can to balance it out on our side, right? Now, the way it was handled tells you everything. You tells need you everything. Yeah. Nothing was recovered from that young lady. And so, and you know what? The war on drugs is one that's silly anyway. And even with no-knock warrants, there are a couple of instances I can almost understand them. If you're dealing with high-level violent drug cartels, you know, human trafficking, something really deceitful, but your, 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 your street-level uh, drug dealer... Whatever, man. It, 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 what, what, what about the innocent children that might be in the house? 
you have other people that you need to be responsible for. So I do like there is, we have to uh, pay a little homage to this. Um, uh, Brianna's Law is something that is being written up right now. Um, and Brianna's Law is against the no knock rates, you know, so it'll, it will make it a mandate that you can't do those anymore. But even while we're waiting on that, uh, which is great, I think that's awesome. Um, I would employ Rand Paul, Rand Paul. Yeah, yeah. With Brianna's Brianna's law. I think that is awesome. That was a great step. And I do appreciate him for that. Um, we have to also make sure that we as Americans, I think this is the thing. <sighs> People have a problem balancing out um, support for Americans and then support for American law enforcement. You can really support both. You know how you do that? You hold them both accountable when they're wrong. It's really simple. You hold them both accountable when they're wrong. If this guy shoots at a cop and unrelated to this incident, right? He shoots at a cop, cop shoots back, kills him. Okay, don't shoot at people with guns. Okay, don't do that, right? It's not a good thing to or do. Or the even more basic, basic point would be if you shoot at someone with a gun, expect to be shot, shot back, back at. at. Yeah, I can go for it. No that. matter what the situation may be, is irrelevant what the circumstances are. Just know that if you send rounds down range, might be some rounds coming back. back your way. And you, you also, we also need to understand that when it comes from a law enforcement side, you holding law enforcement accountable is not you being anti-cop. If you love someone or something, you always want the better for it, right? You want, the, you, want, you want it to grow. Think about the way you treat your kids, right? You love them, but you're going to say, hey, that was wrong, and you need to take corrective action to make, that, make sure that doesn't happen again. And it's the same situation. Hey, I support you, but that's jacked up. We need to do better. We can't have that, right? And so I don't, I don't understand why people can't get to the notion of or the, the understanding of you can be pro law enforcement and pro the average everyday American by holding them both accountable, but making excuses when you have government agents coming inside of your home. What was the young man's name? Um, he was uh, unfortunately killed last year. I think it was due to a, a red flag law. Duncan Limp. Duncan Limp, that young man. Same kind of situation, right? Like we have to be able to look at, are you okay while you're making excuses? Are you okay with setting a standard that it is okay for American law enforcement to come inside of your home and not be held accountable for the actions that occur? So. The same thing when we look um, with the, the Botham John situation. Now, granted, that wasn't an on-duty thing. That was a woman walking walking into the wrong apartment, shot a guy eating a bowl of ice cream, right? Like, you, we cannot become comfortable with that standard. You can take race out of it. You can take everything out of it, but the fact that American citizens should not be okay with American law enforcement or federal agents or anybody else coming into their dwelling, violating their rights, and then the American citizen being held responsible for the, the actions that occur. We cannot. And I understand that um, Amber Geiger was hit with a light, I think, eight years or something or 10 years or whatever it was. And I think she's even appealing that we have a little bit of accountability there, not nearly as much as it should be. But even with that, what what did they try to do? They try to slaughter uh, both of John by saying he had a small amount of marijuana in his apartment. Like it's always about uh, making the victim the villain. And it's a thing that's also crazy in America overall. We always want to make the 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 victim, the villain. Same thing we did with um, Ahmaud Arbery down in Brunswick, right? Did you, did you, did you, I don't know if you ever listened to what the GBI investigator um, said in open court and said that was said after Ahmaud was killed? What was that exactly? Okay, great. Um, so it's going to be vulgar. All right. So, um, and this is not dealing with directly with Brianna. This is dealing with the mindset of the fact that America loves to to slaughter people even in our own death. Like, right, we want to defame them. We want to make sure it's that, bad enough that they're dead. Yeah, and you right. just keep going. Now, even with that particular situation, all after the McMichaels chased him down, the GBI investigator, you know, once again, these are the facts are presented to us. Okay, the GBI investigator states that hey. Um, Greg McMichael, the elder McMichael, stated that he did not see Ahmaud Arbery, in fact, committing any crime. He just looked suspicious. Travis McMichael was a little bit hot headed because January of that year, his dad moved his truck, forgot to lock the damn door. Somebody took a gun out of the truck. Right. So he's already like on neighborhood watch high alert. Right. Yeah, sort of a was, disposition towards anything that anything. can be taken. Yeah. That right. way. So they chase him down. All right. William Brody joins the little charade and. They're, they're, they're chasing them down, corralling them. Greg hops in the back of the truck. So I'm this dude. I'm this young black kid in the, in the South. And I got, you know, um, three white guys chasing me in pickup trucks, one standing in the bed. 
Imagine that. Imagine that amount of fear that's going through your damn head. And then America is all like, well, he was a criminal. He was arrested for carrying a gun in 19. But yet we turn around and defend uh, Kyle Rittenhouse for carrying a gun at 17. But I digress. But he was arrested for carrying a gun in 19 years. Oh, cool. He was arrested. He was charged. He served his little time. He did what he did. Then he was involved in another incident with the police on camera, um, a slight resistance, but they wind up letting him go. And then he had an incident with some stolen property out of Walmart or whatever. But not not a murderous, rampage, crazy criminal. Right. But America goes through his history and says, well, look at these things he did. And he was jogging with the wrong stuff up. So they just go slaughtering this kid. OK, cool. But when the facts come out, so you did all that. But when the facts come out, after he was shot and killed, when he de decided to fight for his life, which we tell people to do all the time, try to avoid it. But if you got to fight, you got to fight. Travis McMichael, and this is per William Brody. This is per the guy that was recording a video says when he ended the video, Travis McMichael was stepping over or looking down at the body of Ahmaud Arbery and yells, F nigger. And America only goes to talk about the kind of shoes he was wearing and what he did in the past. That's what the that's what the majority of Americans did. Or they did not come back with the same energy and say that, you know what, the kid didn't commit a crime. Uh, we even have one of the guys to chase him down admitting to that. Then you don't come back and say, you know what, America, we're sorry that this young man was killed. I was wrong. I sh it didn't matter what he did before. The young man had nothing going then. And then on top of that, Travis McMichael, you know, feds are going to, you don't want the feds in your business. The feds start no, digging definitely, through. <laughs> definitely don't want the feds, feds in your business. business. They start digging through his social media. Guess what they find? They find, uh, I guess he was in a Coast Guard. Um, and they find um, a comment that he leaves to a buddy on some kind of form that says, hey, Guess what? You know, the uh, best part about being whatever kind of boat he was on, uh, the best part about this, and the guy was like, what? He was like, I don't have to deal with any uh, f niggers. So this dude has a history of the way that he feels about people. And then he murders a young black kid. And America was so busy slaughtering him. You got all these conservative types that are out there, you know, uh, you know, going at this kid and trying to, you know, make him look like a, a buffoon and somebody that deserved to be murdered. But even with that situation, when we had somebody outrightly do something wrong, America decided to side on the fact that the people they viewed as being lawful gun owners that could do no wrong. And that's why we have another cultural issue in this country, because you got a lot of people looking at our mind like, I'm not saying the kid was a perfect kid, but does that warrant his death? Does that warrant yeah. somebody standing over his body, calling him a nigger while he's bleeding on the ground dying? Being, you know, being imperfect is not a death sentence. No. Right, and, and I don't think anyone would ever refute that. We'll be there right now. When, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so when we look at the situation, um, backtracking just a tiny amount to Brianna and and also, you know, Ahmed Aubrey, is when you look at, you know, these situations, right? And we look at holding the police accountable, holding each other accountable, you know, holding each situation accountable. As you, like the what you mentioned about someone being slaughtered even in their death. Mm -hmm. That resonates and that means a lot. I feel like there's also a really important component to the entire equation that people tend to not think about. And that is you need to look within before you start looking at other people, right? You need to look at your lifestyle, your life, your decisions. You need to own the decisions that you make in your everyday life. And that includes a heinous social media post like the Coast Guard fellow that you yep. mentioned. That includes the things that you say, owning the things that you say, right? The internet has provided this really strange, um, you know, cloak that we're able to put on and say horrible things about people and to people and towards people and not suffer the consequences <laughs> of the things that we say, right? Uh, I, I think I, I can probably, I can't quote Ice Cube exactly, but you know, he posted, a, he made a post the other day where he's like, you know, the internet, back in my day, when you said jacked up stuff to people, you got your butt whipped, right? Yeah. And, and that's true, right? So people have gotten very accustomed to not owning the things that they say to others. It's easy to just talk trash on the internet and think that your words and your actions don't have consequences. Correct. And for the people that are careful with their words, not saying that you don't give your opinion. Um, let me also thank you for having and engaging in, you know, fruitful conversation, uh, because a lot of times like I, I like to say that the, the, the stupidity always gets the amplification. Right. So for the people that aren't being ravaging idiots, thank you for, you know, engaging in conversation and asking the right questions. And, you know, even if you're a person that likes to wait on the facts, I can't get mad at you for that. Right. I can't I, I, I can't. It's, it's, it's unrealistic to do that. However, um, for the people that 
are using um, this medium as a way to cause more havoc. Um, just realize that this is the same country you can't claim to love and you could also be causing some of the pain. Just realize that, right? Because I think we need to get to a point, even with the Ahmad situation, the the thing that gets swept up under the rug is the fact that, you know, Greg and Michael was able to use his influence in law enforcement to almost get this thing swept up under the rug where we never heard about it, right? Which was like my biggest thing with it. The officer that even showed up on scene wanted to arrest the McMichaels. The responding officer wanted to arrest them, but yet because he's buddy buddies with the prosecuting attorney, it goes away until it gets to the state level. You had two prosecuting attorneys that turned it down saying they're all good. Then all of a sudden the GBI gets involved at the state level when you can't sweep it under the rug anymore when it gets national attention. And all of a sudden now we're gonna seek justice. But if that hadn't happened, who would be representing that young man right now? Right. So, hey, America, look, people, it's OK to feel the way you feel. I'm never going to try to control somebody's voice. You are entitled to feel you way you feel. You know what? You're going to say what you're going to say, too. The only thing I'm saying is if you are trying to uh, move this country forward, then you need to be able to at least have a reasonable, rational conversation with people. Understand that your loyalty should be to we the people. That's where your loyalty should be. We the people. Everything else is a bonus. It's a bonus, right? We the people, we're going to argue, we're going to fight, we're going to disagree, all that. That's going to happen. But it is a brotherhood of we the people that is supposed to be what we're building around. It's supposed to be we the people, not them the government. But somehow we've lost that We've lost that edge. We've lost the, the understanding that I can stand here right now and disagree with you about something. You can disagree with me about something. Hell, we might even raise our voices a little bit. But at the end of the day, I understand that the person standing next to me, if stuff goes wrong, is going to be the person I need to fight with me if it goes wrong. Right. So all this government collapse and uh, tyranny that we talk about. Well, I don't get why when we have small doses of tyrannical things happening, Americans then want to backtrack. They want to then say, well, now you want to make excuses for the tyranny. You want to make excuses for it. But you're also, we're also the same people that are saying, no, when it happens, this is what we're going to do in response because we stand next to each other. Really? And as soon as something happens, you separate yourself. I think it's, it's definitely clear to try to approach that. Well, not try. We should approach the situation you should always put the shoe on the other foot and view the situation as if it happened to you or someone close to you and try to put yourself in that mindset, right? So these situations are tragic and they don't always make sense to us. And I know even when the facts do come out, it's like then they get, you know, pulled in all these different directions by, you know, mainstream media and everything like that. So it can be hard to really even develop an opinion because of all the conjecture that gets thrown around in every different direction. I think the the takeaway, at least for me personally, is that we've got to do a much better job of just being honest with ourselves and be able to have the com the hard conversations. You know, sometimes, you know, yeah, there are conversations that are not easy to have. You know, this video is not an easy video to make. I mean, when you look at, you know, a situation where there's only so many things that I can say in the most direct and honest way that I can say it, but it's not going to resonate in the same way uh, that it will be coming from someone that you view as a peer and as an equal uh, to you. And the bottom line is that's just the way the world works, right? That's the way we tend to look at things. We sort of, you know, fall, fall into our little tribes, right? And it's really easy to just say, oh, well, it doesn't affect my little tribe. So we're just going to automatically brush it aside as, not, as being a non-issue, right? But I think the more clear uh, view, you know, moving forward is that it's OK to hold police accountable and it's all OK to hold each other accountable. But there's another, I believe, again, the most crucial thing is to hold yourself accountable mm. for your actions, for your words, for your social media posts. You know, I think 100 years from now. I always say this all the time. I'm going to I'm going to overuse this, but I'll say it in this particular video that. A hundred years from now, people are going to look back on the social media megalodon, the social media sphere as it exists, as being a really strange time in our in our history. Right? Social media is a great thing, and it and it does enhance and enrich our lives in some very helpful ways, but also in some unhealthy ways because there's almost this unabashed reasoning to say, "Oh well, I'm going to treat this person that I don't like." with this certain amount of just 
cruelty that you really wouldn't treat that person with in real life. But those treatments, those comments, those posts, those outbursts, that rage has consequences. Yeah. And, you know, whether it's a consequence that you never see the realization of because you don't have to deal with it, you know, basically, you know, you say some bull crap to someone and they punch you in the face. Well, if you never have to experience that, you don't know, you know, how to have a real and meaningful conversation. And the reason that I think that applies here is, okay, this this Coast Guard fellow that was making those horrible comments, mm-hmm. right? Probably never thought in a million years that anybody would see it. Mm-hmm. Nope. That it would have any consequence. And, all right, being stolen from is wrong, right? It, it, just because you left your truck unlocked. All right, anyone can say all of the where's, why's, and whatnot surrounding that situation. But the bottom line is is that our passions and our cruelties have consequences and that can go far further than we might have the ability to accept and affect people in ways that we may not be able to understand the way it affects people. And it's just tragic. I always use the word tragic because it is tragic. You know, what happened with Mr. Arbery was tragic. What happened with Miss uh, Breonna Taylor was tragic. So how do we take these tragedies and convert it into something that we can use to learn moving forward and prevent these things from happening again. Mm -hmm. How do we as a society, I'm not gonna say wash our hands because that's a really final way to look at it, right? You know, when you're done cooking, you wash your hands. No, we're not washing our hands at all. That is definitely not the answer. The answer is how do we, you know, sort of honor the, the, the situation in a way that it's not forgotten and that we learn from it so it doesn't happen again. Well, I think one thing I would say that Brianna's Law is a great start. Yep. Even though I would I would prefer for her to be alive um, than that to be the case. But if we have to find a positive out of it, I would say that's a, a start because those things should definitely end. So I'm thankful for that. Um, I am also going to say this. I get it. There are going to be a lot of people that listen to what you've been saying about just, you know, being reasonable, being sensible and things like that. And they're going to golf at it, right? They're going to, whatever. Cool. You do you. Just realize that when, if you're one of those people that's like, oh, America, well, America has a pretty nasty past. Um, But one of the things that she's always spoke about attempting to do well, at least, is being all for one and one for all. And you suck at that. All right. So, you know, if you're going to want this country to be better. You got all these people that are yelling on whether they're a popular person or not a popular person, whatever the case may be. You're yelling about progression as far as, you know, the country moving forward and everybody coming together and why can't we all just get along and all these different things. Well, the reason we can't is because mm, half of people with via the platforms of social media are unreasonable and nobody wants to get along with you. Um, you can't really have a conversation. That's the reason why I say yeah. we can deal with the facts and then I can also separate. This is how I emotionally feel, but my emotions don't change the facts. And you notice that KD didn't say anything about which political side of the coin nope. that those divisions exist on, that they exist intrinsically within the confines of our society. And you never know when it's going to rear its ugly head. I don't. I, look, man, <laughs> everybody that knows me knows that I'm not doing this whole political identity thing. If you want to identify as something, I don't care what hyphen you put up right. in front of it. Right. I don't care what hyphen. But if it ends with American, then those my people. Right. So those are the people that I have to live with every day. Those are the people that I have to be involved with. And I don't like some of y'all. <laughs> some of y'all don't like me. And guess what? That's who I have to live with every day. That is those are the, the cars that I've been dealt in life. So I am trying to do better at living amongst people that I have to be involved with. And what I understand is that, hey, it's supposed to be us from an elementary level. Us. We the people making sure we keep them, the government, in line. So be very careful when you start providing excuses for tyranny. I agree. Because that's what you're doing, right? And, and look at this. How many, it was a red flag situation, but kind of the same thing about police coming in your house unwanted and things like that. Uh, Whiskey Warrior, Alex Booth, 556. Five, Remember the guy in, in the apartment, the garage apartment in New York? And he was like, hey, I got the red coat surrounding me with his plate carrier on and all that. Yeah. Um, you have people 
Now, I'm not going to say with the information they were provided with at the time. I'm not going to say they were wrong or right. Um, but you had people like, you had people driving up there. I had one guy send me an entire video of his entire drive up there. And the only thing I could say is, hey, yo, let's let don't show up and get to like shooting at the cops. Like, you know, like, don't do that. Just just don't do that. Um, but you have people riding up there. This dude, even his social media grew from uh, nothing, a thousand to what, 155 something thousand or less than a day because everybody wanted to back him up. He was a drunk that was stalking and beating his ex. OK. And of course, nobody knew that at the time. Right. Nobody knew that at the time. Right. But that's when I, the support kind of started backing off for him, which I get. Right. Of course. Totally and, understand and naturally it did. So and as people found out more information, but you ran to his aid so fast, he's still alive, but you won't come to the aid of a woman that's dead. It's kind of crazy when it's the same situation. If you think about it, the difference is they didn't surround her house. They went in. Right. And so it's in same thing with uh, Duncan Lip. Right. Same kind of situation. So, yo. And there wasn't nearly the backlash within the social media world for Duncan Lip. We, we choose to, and look, man, and for people that will still... No I mean, matter, to be fair. You know. Despite what I say, people that's going to be like, oh, you're just, you know, I, I get accused of being BLM all the time. I don't know why. I have no idea. I think, well, I do know why. I get accused automatically of being BLM. But I am not anti-law enforcement. I am pro-justice against whomever does something wrong. If you listen to the reasonable voices, most people... Are just concerned with accountability yes it's accountability at the bottom of it it's accountability if i go out right now and i run across the divider i, I drink 30 beers and i run across the divider and kill a family by going head on you expect for there to be a consequence for that i should be held accountable for that so we just want to make sure that everybody citizens law enforcement my favorite group of people politicians everybody is held accountable for their actions and that's it. If we do that, accountability, and that's why I think even in Breonna Taylor case, it's like, hmm, we're going to pay you. We're going to not charge you. And we're just going to let this whole thing just kind of because they don't want to be accountable. So we're going to, we're just going to, yeah, we're just going to leave that. Now, what precedent does that set? The precedents that it sets is that the people that are in law enforcement and let's just say district attorneys and other prosecutors and things are going to use that as a litmus test so that moving forward they're going to go, oh, well, we can just wash this thing in the same way we did the Breonna Taylor situation. So we, we, don't, we don't want that. So people, I don't care um, where you come from. I don't care what your political I ideals are. What I care about now, I have my things that I'm passionate about. You have your things that you're extremely passionate about. You all are going to have your things that you're extremely passionate about. But what I care about at the end of the day is that we the people can all be OK. And it, it pains me when I see us forfeiting those ideals, when I see us carving it over. Now, look, at the same time, to give you some balance, there are plenty, plenty of cops that recently have lost their careers because they were outspoken. We had the one cop due to COVID. Um, he lost his career. We've had several uh, officers, several uh, other officers that have been outspoken about the injustice uh, that have been occurring that have lost their careers. So there are cops out there that are putting it all on the line and losing their careers. Right. So we also have to make sure that we understand that if you are somebody that's like, you know, screw the police, slow down, slow down. Because there are plenty of those guys and girls that are also risking it all because they are also more pro justice than anything and that's just where we all need to be look up uh greg anderson he's one of the the, the big ones in that regard he mm -hmm. he lost his job over a social media post so there are good people that are out there trying to do the right thing and trying to be the change they want to see so um maybe hey, this i'm sorry guess who's firing those cops let me say this people i'm sorry i got no that's fine let me say this do to you, you man <laughs> here's what you should understand if you're mad at the cops right Here's what you should understand. And I'm not saying you don't have a right to be mad because you can be mad at anybody. But I want you to think about something. Everybody that is employed by an uh, agency has a boss, right? So in most cities, the chief of police 
is appointed and or hired or and or selected or whatever you want to say by the mayor. All right. The mayor is going to come to that chief with certain things they want to see happen. Reduce this, fix that, whatever the case may be. Remember, mayors are also responsible for bringing an influx of uh, money and things into the area. Right. Growing an area, creating jobs, all those things. Right. So you got an investor that wants to come in, but they're like, I'm not going to dump this. 40 million dollars into your city until this crime rate goes down because I can't get clients or business to do business there because the crime rates are horrible. So the mayor gets the chief, tells the chief to get rid of all these things. The chief then passes that down to his command staff. Command staff sends it to sergeant, sergeant say it at roll call and then hold you accountable therefore. So while you're mad at the cops, I'm not saying whether you're justified or not, that's irrelevant. Understand who's giving them the directives. So what you need to do is climb your butt right back up the chain and at least stop at that city mayor and understand what they told law enforcement to do, what pressure they put on law enforcement to bring back. Because what they're doing is they're throwing a rock and they're hiding. What they're gonna do is, hey, go do this, chief. Figure it out, get sure. it done, right? Because I got pressure on me, I wanna keep my job, go get it done. What happens is that street cop does something and then are like, well, I can sacrifice one of you. So the politician then helps throw that cop up under the bus, right? And at the same time as that politician that gave the directives that flowed downhill. So just remember this. You can be mad at the person on the ground, but who gave them the direction? Who set them out? Who started that downhill roll? Who did that? It's going to be your politicians. Guess what? They're the ones that are responsible. Guess what? They're the ones that are putting pressure on those people. You ever said, I don't know if anybody's ever been employed by a city. I have. Trust me, the political pressure sucks. It sucks, right? But these are the directives they are pushing downhill. But you know what? We jump right by them. We don't pay any attention to them because they get out there with this lovely letter like, I can't believe it happened. Oh, I can't believe that this occurred. But you're the person that started it, right? You're just have throwing this guy up under the bus or these people up under the bus to preserve face. But we need to start realizing that I don't care what side of the political aisle you're on. When you get mad in a certain area about the policies that are going on, I want you to remember something. Policy, okay? A lot of policies and or laws, or whatever you want to call them, are written by politicians. The police enforce the policy. They are the enforcement of the policy written by the politicians. So, be mad over here, that's fine. But I need you to make sure you climb right back up that ladder and get to the source. Remember that. I'm, I, just, I just wanted to say that. Remember that. I think that's a great point, KD. And I'll just add, you know, that when you wash the politics away from the situation, there's still a human being under that uniform. And no amount of, and, and maybe this is, we might be slightly off on this, but I still feel that there's still a human being under that uniform with his own morals and values and principles. And you know right from wrong and nothing's ever going to change that. And there's always that thought in the back of your mind that is what you're about to do right? Do you really know that it's right in your heart before you do it? We still have that ability. Just because some overseer says do this doesn't necessarily mean that you still don't stop being a human being. Correct. Like you shouldn't be kneeling on somebody's neck for almost nine minutes, stuff like that. Absolutely. 100%. So, um, guys, thanks for tuning in for today's Gun Gripe. I know we covered a lot of territory. We really wanted to give um, some girth to the uh, Breonna Taylor situation and as it's it's panning out, because I know there's a lot of folks talking about it and there's a lot of information being, um, you know, drawn around about it. This is a great talk. Yeah. Great talk. And um, I, I hope you guys, you know, maybe your perspective's been challenged a bit. Maybe you thought about this in a way that you, you know, didn't entertain before. And that's what all of this is about. That's what Gun Gripes is at its core, is trying to just present things in a way that allow you to maybe maybe understand that there's a different way of thinking than what you what you think. And 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 try to try to look at it from a bunch of different perspectives before you draw a conclusion on a given situation. I would I would agree. And I would just say this. We if we're going to move forward as a country. We have to first move forward within ourselves. You have to be willing to grow. You have to be willing to change. And sometimes you got to be willing to stand on your, your, your fundamental values. I'm not saying you, sh you shouldn't do that. But we need to make sure that we are looking at things at, at a viewpoint that benefits us all. 
it is tragic and sad that this young lady is not with us. It's very tragic and sad. The only thing that's worse, worse is you slaughtering her and her death. That, that is not humane. Like, do we, it might be on a different scale, but, and this is rhetorical, did we do that to the people in Waco? Right? We didn't slaughter them to death. And they were doing some pretty weird stuff. Doesn't mean it was criminal. and doesn't mean they deserve to die. Yeah, it doesn't mean they're worth dying. Right. Yeah, for sure. No, absolutely not. I, 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 I just thought it was different. Okay, you live a different life. America, right? Rock and on. And being weird is not illegal either. It's not illegal. And when we start giving excuses for our people being dead by saying that something they did three years ago led up to their death today. She's a young woman in her mid-20s. And this is what I will challenge you on. You ever been 20? You ever been 25? Hell, you ever been 35? You mean to tell me you never made a mistake? You've never done something that you regretted doing? You've never tried to correct your path in life? You've never had a come to Jesus moment and realized that I need to do something different? And then you try to move on and do the right thing. How would you feel if somebody blamed you for your own death just because you had the experience of life? Right? So, yeah. um, I just, I just would like to leave everybody with, remember, we the people are supposed to be important. I'm going to have things, you're going to have things that we're all, we all care about, that we're all passionate about. But at the end of the day, you should be more humane and care about your brother and your sister that is next door to you. And it does not mean that you need to go out and be anti anybody. It just means just, you should just be pro justice. You want to see everybody treated equally under the guise of the law. If that is imbalanced, we can't move forward until we fix that. And then we can start talking about how screwed up the system is in general. But I agree. <laughs> I agree. And, and you know, the, that door was not kicked in that night because of Brianna's past. No, it was not. She was not on trial for her past. She was an innocent bystander. Anyway, it's, it's, it's very tragic. And we hope that, you know, the, the, the country can sort of heal and move forward in a way that will hopefully not allow something like this to happen again. Or at least, That's all we can hope, or at least learn from it, or something. Or speak up about it. Even even if you thought everything that you that the internet is saying about her is true, what does it have to do with her death in that moment? Yeah. But even if everything was true, if she broke up with the dude a week before, does that mean she deserved to die? And we we just have to be better at that. We have to we have to be better at that. I wish Brianna was uh, um, around, and I know that a lot of people are gonna like look up Brianna Taylor on various social media platforms, YouTube and all those things. And I know this will be on YouTube. Hey, if you are connected to Brianna Taylor, if you are a family member, friend, uh, former classmate, co-worker, uh, whatever the case may be, I am sorry for your loss. I'm sorry that you had to lose a person that you cared about. Um, and I implore you to please ignore any of the hurtful and hateful comments that you might see it is the world the world wide web right so you're going to see those type of things but um i'm sorry that that had to happen to you i'm sorry that brianna's mom has to deal with this suffering and i'm sorry uh to be brianna's spirit that you are still being killed in death um even though somebody already snuffed out your life so um yeah that's it i wish you all the best yeah i don't think there's anything else can be said in that regard yeah Guys, thanks for tuning in. We hope that uh, maybe this you know, video opened up your eyes, made you think a little bit differently. We're going to have KD back for more videos, so make sure that you go over and subscribe to his YouTube channel, follow him on Instagram, all the other social media particulars. Uh, you'll see that in the description box below. Uh, KD, thanks for joining me today. No, man. Thanks for having me on. Good Great talk. conversation, man. They're gonna, a lot of your followers are going to tell you don't have me back, though. They're going to say what? They're going to say don't have him back. Oh, they can. Oh, I'm just a, saying, man. I'm just saying. Look, they're saying it right now. <laughs> Have a great day. Many more videos on the way. We'll see you soon. Peace.